Welcome to the UAC podcast. This is Joseph Johnson with you as always and um, joined by our newest author uh, and new friend, Adam Petway, uh, who wrote uh, our, our newest released uh, Basketball Mechanics, which was kind of a unique uh, project for us, something we hadn't gotten into in an individual sport, uh, but, but really interesting for me. So, Adam, thanks a lot for joining me, and uh, I'm really excited to hear uh, about the book. Yeah, thanks for having me, Joseph. Uh, this has been a just an awesome process, and it's a, you know, it's a labor of love. So it's finally uh, out, and you know, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing the feedback and just kind of as we uh, kind of prep for the for the next edition, um, just you know, people's thoughts. But yeah, thanks for having me on. Hey, it, this has been an interesting thing for me personally because basketball is kind of my favorite sport. Uh, I played in high school, so I had kind of like a, just a natural uh, kind of inkling towards it, I guess, uh, other than uh, than I might have. Um, so before we go very far, I want to get an idea just kind of like how this evolved for you. So if you would, just real quickly, give us a, a quick background uh, as to how you got to this place. Yeah, no. So I, I pretty much coach basketball on every level. So I started out you know, so as a high school coach um, oh, wow. and I was a I was a ninth grade boys coach at uh, John Carroll High School in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and I also ran all the strength and conditioning. Right. And what what I found through that process is like I actually love the physical press preparation aspect way more than the tactical X's and O's. Um, so so from there, I went to Catholic University, which is a division three university um, in Washington, D.C., um, really, really good. They, they won the national championship in 2001, I believe. So really good program, good people there. Um, but, but same deal. So I was an assistant coach. So I was recruiting, breaking down film, uh, running drills in practice. But since it's the D3 level, I also was the director of strength and conditioning. So that kind of gives me a unique prism, I think, um, based on my background and how I view the game and how I view physical preparation um, from a tactical perspective. Um, so from there, I went and um, worked with George Washington men's basketball and Maryland men's basketball um, and, and the women's team at Maryland as well. Um, there that, you know, I was exposed to really, really good coaches, a guy named Ben Kenyon, who's now the head strength coach at uh, the 76ers and a guy named Kyle Tarp at the University of Maryland. Um, they, they taught me so much on just, you know, programming, how to be, you know, a, a true professional they, they were just really, really high level practitioners that I, I'm thankful to be around. Um, from, from there, I went to the University of Arkansas and that was my longest stint. I was there for five years. Um, I, I had the opportunity to work with men's basketball, um, but you know, I, I also had the opportunity to work with a couple of post-collegiate uh, sprinters and jumpers in track and field. And Arkansas, probably one of the best, if not the best track and field program in the country. I think on uh, it leading up to rio in 2016 olympics we had nine olympians that were student athletes not tyson gay or wallace spearman or veronica camel brown we had wow. andy morris uh gold medalist in the pole vault omar mcleod uh gold medalist in the hurdles jaron lawson long jumper so these were student athletes that were going on competing at arkansas and like i had the chance to be around and then go and medal in the rio olympics um so, so there, that kind of um, kind of speared my thought process and expanded my prism and how I view things and how I evaluate the sport of basketball, right? Um, so, so within that, um, I had the opportunity to coach um, a guy named Wallace Spearman, two-time Olympian. Uh, it's time of 1965. It's still top 10 all time in the 200 meters. Um, so prepping for world champs and Olympics and, and things like that. So it, it gave me it gave me perspective and it also exposed me to guys like, you know, coach Boos next Snyder, who's a mentor of mine. Um, we, we consulted with him um, a, a lot. So, so that, that kind of, kind of changed my perspective on how I evaluate the game of basketball, being exposed to all those good speed power athletes. Um, so fast forward um, from there, I had the opportunity to work as a, like a biomechanist for the Philadelphia 76ers in the NBA uh, built out some really cool projects. Um, was there for two and a half seasons, uh, had an opportunity to work in D.C. this past season uh, with the Washington Wizards as director of athletic performance. And now I'm back in the Philadelphia era coaching uh, horizontal jumps at uh, Westchester University. And I'm also uh, an adjunct professor at Mississippi State. 
so having having all of these different experiences kind of led to the epitus behind riding basketball mechanics, right? Yeah, that that's uh, interesting. But like the background there is kind of almost perfect for that. Having the coaching on the te- technical tactical side, but also looking at technique and things of that nature uh, in track and field, because that's so much more. Uh, technique oriented, if you will. It's such a base part of that fundamental. And then coming back to basketball on the performance side, like it's like the perfect storm for you to be able to write a book like this, it, you know, because you, all, each one of those ingredients is, is critical to you being able to, to having that kind of background and knowledge to write this. So that's kind of uh, <clears throat> almost a necessary kind of path for you to take to be able to write a book like this, because this is unique. And I got to say, before we you know, we did it and, and, and you had reached out to me, uh, I, I thought, wow, that's uh, uh, an interesting perspective that I thought I probably would not have ever heard, of, to be honest with you. Like, I didn't think, I never thought that I would get approached with a book about the mechanics, the, the biomechanics and stuff of, of, of basketball, technical, tactical stuff. And, and so that's what really intrigued me, to be honest with you. Because as you know, you know, I've, you know most of our books are, more broader and conceptual, uh, you know, and things of that, like that. And uh, so this was really cool for me, I, to be honest with you, because I thought uh, I, I was I was just as curious as a reader as I was as uh, the publisher, to be honest with you, just to see how you guys looked at it and, and approached it. So so when you were getting to the point of writing the book, what spawned the idea? Like what was what kind of sparked that? Yeah, so I was actually. Um... I was down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, just uh, kind of shadowing my mentor, Coach Boo. And, you know, we, we always go back and forth. And I, I just asked him, recommended, like, uh, hey, do you got any, like, literature you'd recommend or any books? And, and there was two that really stood out. One was uh, uh, Sports Biomechanics and Techniques of, uh, of the Technical Aspect of Sports by James Hay. And the other was uh, Jeffrey Dyson's book, Mechanics of Athletics, right? So um, Dyson's book actually takes track and field and takes like the physics and biomechanics and kind of breaks it down of looking at, um, you know, uh, ground reaction forces of the block start or centripetal acceleration as you're like approaching the J to a high jump. So it takes each event, right, breaks it down from a mechanical standpoint and how what are the top athletes in the world doing for that genre? So I believe. You know, he was a guy from the UK, and I believe he wrote it in 1968. So going in, like, what what are the best athletes look like uh, for that time period? Um, and then James Hay, he was a researcher from the University of Iowa, uh, originally from New Zealand, did a lot, a ton of great research on the horizontal jumps. But his book was mainly geared to the technical aspects, right? So he would look at, like, trajectory of a jump shot in basketball. And like, you know, what's the release velocity at, you know, which angle does it occur? Uh, Looking at like coefficient of restitution as you bounce a basketball, things like that. So, uh, you know, I started going back and forth and I was like, well, why can't we take both ideas conceptually and blend it and see what makes the world's best basketball athletes from a mechanical standpoint? Um, So I got, you know, one of my best friends is a guy named Ryan Richmond. He's a he's an assistant coach uh, in the NBA. So. You know, he, um, he X's and O's guy, really brilliant guy, came up in the video room. So really good with breaking down film. So him and I kind of went back and forth and we said, OK, you know, I have this idea. I want to write a book. I want to, you know, determine what what is what are the factors and characteristics involved from a physics standpoint and a biomechanical standpoint of the world's top performers in the game of basketball. Right. So we kicked around a couple of ideas and uh, that's how we came up with our methodology. So um, there's a software database called uh, uh, Synergy. So it just ranks top 10 offensive players in the league based on tactical situations. So points per possession. So, for example, um, pick and roll guards. For every pick and roll, if you score your points per possession, if you're top 10, it's considered like success, right? So the more points per possession within that situation, like it is going to like give you a higher ranking where defensively it's the exact opposite. So rim protection, if you, if you're protecting the rim and have a high success rate, it's the least amount of points per possession during that tactical situation. Right. So, so we had our definition, right. 
we had exact players, top 10 in 14 different tactical categories. So then him coming from the, the video room there and, uh, you know, having that background, he sent a ton of film out. And this was actually right as the pandemic hit. So we actually had time. Without, without that time, we probably wouldn't have gotten this project done for, you right. know, gosh, it probably would have taken six, eight years. But, you know, we, we hammered it away. He sent, I mean, we, we went thousands of hours of just breaking down clips, um, determining what sequence of patterns led to, uh, you know, uh, Chris Paul in a ball screen situation or Rudy Gobert in a rim, protect, uh, rim protection situation. So, like, it, it just took very, very um, – thorough investigation but it, it was a it was a byproduct of just you know being curious and starting with a question um so one, once we kind of filtered out created a database um we then wrote up okay what what are we looking at from each tactical situation um from a physics standpoint so we picked one thing so for example in, in transition um we wanted to look at horizontal ground reaction first and then we wanted to look at are athletes faster with or without the basketball, right? So we dichotomize the group. You can either score a transition like you're running to the ring, you catch it, you shoot a three, or you grab the rebound on the defensive end, dribble all the way up, coast to coast, and get a layup. Um, and we actually found that the best athletes in the world are faster with the basketball and have higher peak velocities and accelerations with the basketball and without. And there's probably a lot to that, but you know, if you're a Damian Lillard, if you're a Kimball Walker, if you're a Chris Paul, you're actually moving at a higher velocity with the basketball opposed to without it. So just really, really interesting stuff like that. We looked at uh, centripetal acceleration on dribble handoffs and trunk lean. What angles are, are those occurring at? Um, we looked at jump strategies. So we looked at uh, vertical ground reaction force and then knee extension velocity versus like hip abduction qualities on like uh, – like blocking shots versus defending ball screens, right? So what what kinematic profiles do the best athletes in the world um, express in all of these situations? So it was a, it was a really fun project. Um, to add another layer to it, um, and this is all publicly available data, and we de-identified each athlete just, just out of respect to the league and the players. Um, so, so you'll just see, hey, this is the top 10 performers in the aggregate of – what this looks like for, you know, pick and roll bigs or post-ups. So it, it's all de-identified, but we, we went on NBA.com and took all of the, the data out of the NBA draft. So anthropometric measures, height, weight, wingspan, standing reach, and then performance metrics from the combine, three-quarter court sprint, vertical jump, uh, lane agility. And we just aggregated it into a huge database. Um, so over 20 years worth of data, um, I believe we had uh, like 12,000 athletes in there, right? Like just a huge wow. database. And we, we started wow. to look for trends in physical characteristics and anthropometric measures within the group, right? So it's like, what do the world's best look like compared to the average of the NBA? And, and there are some things, you know, obviously, um, you know, like uh, rim protectors have a longer reach, right? It's just a, an identifier of being good at rim protection. But we found that it was actually three standard deviations away from the mean relative to the average of the NBA. So they were really, really long. So, and again, you can't teach length, but you can identify it and recruit it, right? Um, yeah. Ball screen situations, best ball screen performers, two standard deviations above the mean compared to the norm of the NBA as it relates to change of direction tasks and lane agility and three quarter court sprint. So your faster, more shiftier guards are going to be better in ball screen situations. Um, and it gives normative values to say, this is what the best in the world do. So if I'm a high school coach, like, like what, is, what model are we working towards? If I'm a D1 basketball coach, like, and you want to get to that level, like you have to have a model to work towards, to know what the elite athletes are doing. Okay. This, this opens up a whole bunch, bunch of questions that came to my head as you were talking. So I'm going to throw a couple at you. Number one. <clears throat> Were you surprised by what you found in any way? Yeah, there, there was a couple of things that, are, that were counterintuitive within the book. Um, the, the, the main one being, uh, I think, is in its most primitive form, you can just reduce it to two things, right? Offensively, you're trying to create space for an uncontested open shot, right? 
Defensively, you want to occupy space to force a low percentage. What separates an elite, world-class athlete from everyone else? Their genes make them quicker, react faster, and more explosive. What if there was a way to, in a sense, turn on those elite athlete genes in the average person? Recent advances in genomic research and sports nutrition have proven this is now possible. Introducing Myosin by Nutromic Sport Nutrition. Multiple studies show it increases quickness, explosiveness, and strength. In most cases, your vertical increases by at least one inch an hour after it's taken. Through a proprietary blend of ingredients, Myosin can affect flips the switch on those genes that make you jump higher, run faster, and lift heavier weights. Here are several Myosync testimonials. This is Daniel Stokes, he's a sprinter. What was your best time before we started training this season with Myosync? Uh, 21.5. And what's your best time as of today? 20.7. Could you um, explain to us um, what the, uh, the fast twitch muscle supplements done for you, Myosync? It made me more explosive. It helped with my reaction time off the ground, bring my knees up quicker, and I continually progress. This is Matt Tomey, head strength and conditioning coach for football and men's basketball at Michigan Tech. If you haven't tried Nutromic Sport Nutrition's supplement Myosync yet, you're definitely missing out. I've had athletes here um, try the supplement and really enjoy the benefits. Uh, including an immediate improvement in vertical jump of about one inch. Myosync really stands out with its ability to improve power output, speed, reaction time, even potentially quick decision making. If you haven't checked out this unique supplement yet, uh, go ahead and pick up a bottle of Myosync and, and give it a shot and just see for yourself. Here is lead formulator Rick Jones' brief explanation of Myosync. Myosync evolved out of the neuroproteomic research we conducted starting back in 2005 uh, to uh, nutritionally boost the speed strength traits of well-trained athletes. These speed strength traits could include things like reaction time, starting power, uh, maximal speed, uh, quickness and agility, and also fine motor skills. Double-blind placebo studies as well as many outcome studies have been conducted on well-trained athletes from many sports and of many ages. The results of this research have shown a sizable boost in muscle contractions as well as the synchronization of these muscle contractions during speed strength activities. contested shot those two things were consistent across the board within every group um i was surprised uh, and I, I won't name any of the athletes right i was surprised some of the athletes defensively that were top 10 because they they have maybe oh this player just kind of takes it no like if you if you watch the film and you look at the statistics there's certain players that have a bad rap that are elite post defenders or elite ball screen defenders, but for whatever reason, they just get a bad kind of reputation. There, there's also a, a couple of athletes too, without giving away too much, that were way more athletic than meets the eye test. So unless you watch them relative mm -hmm. to the context, like we had a couple of guys that I would have never thought, one of them I coached would be top 10 in transition, but then you look at how they maneuver, and how they express velocities and accelerations and joint angles and amplitudes and force production. And you're like, oh, okay, that, that actually makes sense. So it, it's kind of paradoxical and counterintuitive by nature. But at the same time, when you really examine the game and when you really look at what the book has to offer, it's like, okay, no, that, that actually makes sense now. Yeah, I, I, I and, and that kind of was leads into one other thing that I wanted to, to I, I'd like to hear you to talk about quickly too is like how much of it defied overall convention, like because like I think in professional sports and probably most of the other ones too, like certain isms almost become law, right? They don't yeah. get questioned anymore. Right. How much? How much of what you found defied absolute convention? Like you know this thing that we thought was true really isn't true as much as we thought or you know was there anything that kind of blew a convention out of the water 
Yeah, I think, I mean, basketball is a brutal sport and extremely physical, particularly in the post, particularly in ball screen yeah. situations, and particularly on direct line drives, right? So the, the fact that people assume that it's just all technical skill, and it is to a, to a certain degree, but the physicality of a, a guy like Joel Embiid or the Joker or LeBron, Kawhi, um the those they're physically just dominant human beings and it, they they do have a lot of technical skill but it's a brutal sport man and you you have to be physically prepared if you're going to be successful within the sport the other thing i would say is economy and efficiency right so you watch lebron you watch Kawhi, you watch Giannis, like they're just really efficient with their movement so they actually have they cover the least amount of distance total in competition the elites do but they have the capacity to move at the highest velocities right so if you look at lebron when he doesn't have the ball he's not moving he's not wasting energy but as soon as he knows when to strike he's on it like i mean he's just like a like a torpedo just <laughs> dive bombing in there so same thing with Kawhi. same thing with all of the elites so they just know when to strike and how to be efficient and economic relative to the tactical aspects of the game. And that's efficient across the board, too. Th those guys aren't wasting movement. And you look at some of the novice, like if you look at, you know, people outside of that threshold or maybe at the bottom ends of some of those categories, they're everywhere. They're just wasting, wasting efficiency. And, and do you relate that back to... IQ more, experience more, or just natural kind of, you know, I don't want to say ability, but like a natural yeah. inclination. Is is it a learned thing, or you know, how, how, what do you what do you attribute it to? I think it's multifactorial. I think I think you can train it. I think it's a trainable quality, um, but I, I do think you there is a certain innate abilities that are involved with something like that, right? So it's like I, I think it's it's multifactorial and has multiple components to it and here's a question that that well I, I got two so this so something like what you what you just laid out would be like would you say like a guide at at, at the combine a guide when you're drafting like a application for a scout or for the scouting room when they're looking at somebody in college and they're like okay here's all of the characteristics that we always look at like these are the, the the you know the the boilerplate right and then there's another layer with your with the, the material that you covered in the book there's another layer of okay now these factors actually probably relate to the game more or to success in the game because how many times have we talked about a guy who on paper has everything and then he doesn't and he doesn't work out can you talk about that like can, are with with the basketball mechanics are you able to kind of dive into that area as to why a guy who seemingly got everything isn't successful or a guy who's unlikely is successful like w did you see any things in there that kind of opened that up to you at all yeah no i i do think it can be applied as talent identification particularly as it relates to performance metrics within the combine and then anthropometric measures as well so length is a principal component on defense. If you want good defensive athletes, like just recruit guys with long wingspans and are tall, and they're more likely going to be better at defense. Um, as it relates to the offensive side of the ball, you, you have to be skilled and crafty and uh, I think economic relative to the tactical aspects of the game. So what we found, particularly in ball screen situations, is the ability to control one's movement um, and kind of dictate pace was really a principal component as it relates to being successful offensively. So uh, specifically as it relates to setting up ball screen situations, there was kind of a, a temporal component to that where there was an undulation of the center of mass where you set up, right? There's a separation, preparation, and attack is what we called it. So just being very fluid, you, you want to set it up, you want to prepare the ball screen and then be able to attack out of that position. Um, so, so I do think that is somewhat counterintuitive because it does take, it's not necessarily the fastest athletes that are going to be successful within those situations, but it's the ones contextually that can control pace and space 
that are going to kind of dominate within like ball screen guard situations. So it's not necessarily being the fastest. I think it's being shifty and being able to control one's movement in that context of the environment, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, exactly. You know, it's it's kind of ironic that you say that because I my my middle son plays basketball and uh, he's a re- really good athlete. But we we noticed that you know those other guys who maybe weren't as good of athletes who did a lot of things better than him. And one of the things that we when we looked at film together was guys who could change their speeds. Yep. And and kind of hit a speed that they want, like literally. You know, kind of like a guy who throws a, a, a change up, but he's got like three different change ups. Like he can go from here to here, here to here, you know, really vary that speed. And he can kind of hit that speed right where he wants it. Right. Whereas um, in, in basketball, like the change of speeds can can be at different places. Like they don't have to be super dramatic. They can be slight or, you know, in the middle. You know, there's a lot of variability there. And you see guys that are able to manage that speed differential you know, as they're playing, are, they're just able to kind of dictate, I guess, a little bit more to everybody else because you have to guess a little bit more as to what they're going to do. Because you haven't, like, if, if you've seen some people, you might, if, if they change speed the same way every time you've seen it, you know, you kind of can see it coming. But right. if you haven't seen but if he's got, like, 10 of those up his sleeve, he's hard to to predict, I guess, if you will, or hard to prepare for. Does that make sense? Like, Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I, I think... Variability, particularly on offense. So defense having the bandwidth to um, occupy space, particularly in ball screen situations, the best defensive ball screen athletes pretty much did the same thing every time and how they defended it. And obviously, like there's a tactical component too, like uh, downing or icing a a ball screen, like of a good ball handler versus going over versus going under a non-shooter did dictate that. However, on the opposite end of the spectrum, offensively, the amount of variability at which, you know, a guy like uh, Kimball Walker or Terry Rozier or Chris Paul was able to create space off of ball screens, it's like they did it differently every time. So it was the same pattern, but they might just have a different amplitude or a different velocity or a different trajectory as they attack the rim. So being able to have a lot of bandwidth and variability offensively was an important skill set where you wanted to limit the variability that could be expressed on the defensive end. So, so again, it goes back to um, I- individual norms relative to the tactical aspects of the game, right? So high level of variability as far as amplitude, velocities, movement patterns on the offensive end, where you want to blunt or limit that variability defensively. So... Would you say then that you could bring this because because, you know, the, the the average coach, you know, out there, you know, different guys in the performance side, they're looking at this. Right. And then I think maybe the technical tactical guys, how does a staff or a coach take the information that you're laying out? And di- I don't want to say digest, but we kind of like start to integrate it into their model. Right. Like if they're in coaches meetings. Right. How does that get integrated into that system? Do you, you know, do you, are you going to have to interpret this data for them or, you know, kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah. Lay that out for me. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, my co-author was, is an NBA assistant coach, uh, Ryan Richmond. So he did a great job of kind of having uh, coaching cues, right? So it's like base body recover. So we need a good base on post defense. We need to body them and push them out away from the basket. And then we need to recover to contest the shot and make it a low percentage contested shot, right? So he he took very complex things <laughs> and whittle it down to make it very simple from like a coaching cues perspective, um, which is uh, brilliant within itself. Where I was thinking more on the sides of like coefficient of restitution and looking at collisional velocities within the post, he broke it down to just answer a question, right? So it's like we started each chapter with a question. Like, um, you know, what what are the best um, what is the sequence of movement of the best uh, post defensive players in the NBA? And then Ryan created coaching cues and vernaculars for each situation to where you can kind of communicate it with the, the technical tactical staff, but also communicate it with the athletes. So I think, um, you know, he did a very, very good job where I kind of looked at more of the biomechanics and the physics behind it. 
um, Ryan broke it down to just very layman's terms as it relates to like basketball coaching. And that's the value, right? Because like, you know, you look at a lot of different books and, you know, it, they sound cool. Uh, and I, you know, <laughs> and they look cool. Right. And I just, I just had this conversation. Uh, what day it was, it was yesterday. I was talking with a friend of mine who's in sports science and professional baseball. And he, and he told me how many technologies they're using and collecting data off of and then uploading it, right? They're, they have to, you know, go through it and digest it, organize it, upload it. Then it goes over to somebody maybe in analytics, you know, blah, blah, blah. And here, but here was my question. And I, would, I wasn't surprised by the answer, but I think some people might be. I said, so what do you do with all that? And he <laughs> says, and he says, nothing. Nothing. Yeah. He said, we, he said, we talk about it. Right. He goes, but it doesn't. He goes, I said, is there any actionable data? And he said, you know, out of eight different technologies, he goes, maybe one of them is actionable. He said, everything else. He said, we look at these guys six ways from Sunday and nothing actually happens, though, after the fact. And the thing that I love about this and I'm, I want to let you I want to let you elucidate this. How is this, how is this actionable in practice? Like you've looked at things, you said, hey, this is what, these are ways that you could be more efficient on the court with your players. How is this actionable? Are you, are, are, are coaches able to take this data, let's say, at, even at the lower levels? You know, I know this is, you know, was birthed around professional sports, but like at, even at the lower levels, the principles are the same, uh, you know, in, in most cases. How do you take this and can you integrate this into a practice? Can you can you can you teach it or can you even take an individual guy? Let's say, you know, there's a lot of NBA trainers now that work with basketball players. Right. And, and a lot of kids go to somebody. Can they take this, the, the, the information they get in this and start integrating it into a training protocol or in into, into practices themselves? How, can, is that possible? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and uh, Yosef, that's actually uh, not uncommon. You're your example from uh from your buddy in sports science where it's just they collect a lot of data it's not actionable and i think i think a lot of that is because it's too many generations or standard deviations away from what the game actually is right so for for me in my evaluation uh like i i've been using you know um lpt and force platforms and 3d kinematics and all these kind of general diagnostic tools which is great i'm the biggest proponent of all of those but ultimately, it, those tools are supposed to be used to either increase performance on the court or field or track or whatever sport, you know, you're working with and identify potential risks and movement aberrances. So for me, like, why not use the game as your evaluation model and then reverse engineer all of your general menu items and training from the game, right? So I, I absolutely think that um, you, you can use it and apply it in different college settings, youth settings, uh, player development settings, because like you have to work towards a model, right? So you, under, you have to understand what the best athletes in the world are doing if you're going to try to model your performance um, after that, right? So if you're just kind of guessing and say, oh, well, I think they're projecting at this angle or I think they're hitting these speeds or I think, you know, their trunk lane is like this on a dribble handoff. Well, you, you don't actually know. Right. So I, I do think that using the game contextually as your evaluation model or having an insight to evaluation is, is really important. Um, the, the other thing is uh, defensively, too. It's like, you know, what does a defensive stance look like of the you know best guards versus the best bigs? How does that change when? You know, it's a pick and pop versus a pick and roll situation. Um, you know, what what are the kinematic factors? You know, we found that, you know, hip abduction velocity was a principal component in ball screen guards as far as a defense. Um, whereas on um, our bigs or our post um, players, the, the defensive uh, mechanism was more just magnitude of lateral ground reaction force. Right. So one was very kinematic and just had to have speed. The other just had to produce a lot of force, even though, you know, essentially they're guarding the same thing. The strategy to do it was much different. Right. So if you have a young athlete 
that is a big and very linky, um, then you probably just want to produce frontal plane ground reaction force. Whereas like you have a guard, like it's probably going to be speed relative to that movement. Right. So I, I think, I think you absolutely can apply it from a developmental standpoint and also from a technical development standpoint. So, so, I mean, this is actionable on so many different levels and usable by people in, in, in various positions, like from the general manager on down, you know, or the, you know, the head coach, uh, depending on the situation, but like you, you, you would be talking about, you could use the material in this book in terms of evaluation, uh, you know, as you're bringing new people in, uh, you could look at it as uh, from a scouting point of view. Uh, even when you're scouting the other team, you could start to maybe fish out some weaknesses somewhere that may not have been totally obvious. I'm thinking am I, you correct me if I'm wrong as I, as I go along here. And, and, and then, yeah, I, I think that's right on point. And, and I think also um, using the combine data as a measurement tool, uh, just hey, anthropometrically and from a performance standpoint, running, jumping, changing direction, length, height. Um, you know, how does our cohort of athletes compare to the best in the world, right? Um, not only the NBA average, but looking at the group to group average, right? So, so again, if I'm, if I'm at, I don't know, the University of Arkansas, or, you know, the University of Maryland, I'm definitely using this as a manuscript to try to model out what my athletes need to become to become elite, you know, relative to their sport. Yeah, and, and then you could use this for the, the, the coach in terms of tactics. Like if we know we got a guy who's not going to be great in, let's say, you know, pick and roll situations for different reasons, you say, okay, this guy's not the guy, or we need to work on this with him in the offseason. We can give him something actionable in the offseason saying, hey, if you can get better here in this particular way and then talk to the performance staff and say, look, He's not good physically in this way. Like it's not a vertical jump. It's not a yes, absolutely. You know, it's yeah. it's not it's because I, I you know it's kind of like when people talk about like I, I know like in New England and I don't know a lot about football but like Belichick doesn't put a lot of stock in the combine. And then you see the guys that he has perform really well and they're not great combine performers. I mean Tom Brady being the poster boy for that, right? Right. Um, but 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 you got a lot of guys on his team who are not great performers. Uh, in terms of combine and and it kind of defies convention why because he's identifying something that's not easy i don't want to say not easy to identify but it's not the, the boilerplate stuff it's not vertical jump and you know because we're making extrapolations to say this guy can jump out of the gym uh you know he runs a 4 40 he's going to be amazing well the fact of the matter is that never happens the people right. the combine up are very rarely a good player Right. I mean, and, and, and strength is the most overrated thing in football uh, and it's overrated in basketball as well. I saw it was funny. I saw the they, they showed they had this, uh, a list of the top 20 strongest guys at the NBA combine history. And none of them played more than two or three years. All the relevance. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't it, it didn't matter. So you're thinking, well, this guy's strong as heck. He's going to be great in certain situations, like let's say with screening or whatever the case is. And he's yeah. not. He's not yeah. a great rebounder or it's whatever all, the case it's all is. about. Joseph, it's all about angles and leverage, man. And, and that's absolutely the New England uh, example is a great one because you look at over the years, guys like Wes Welker or Julian Edelman, they, I mean, their 40 time was probably about what mine would be right now, right? But they, they knew how to run routes. They understood angles. They understood amplitudes. They understood velocities. They understood excels and decels. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it's all, uh, uh, Yosef, it's all about leverage. It's all about angles. It's all about physics. And if you can yeah. kind of um, understand that and create your model around that, then it, it will be really easy to identify specific amplitudes that are needed from an elite level ball screen guard. You know, it's just not raw speed, right? Yeah, yeah. And you, you, you're reminding me now of like my own roots because, you know, Dr. Michael Yeses has been my mentor for 28 years now and you know we did we did work with basketball players and uh, you know for quite a while and he said he's always said he goes look the, the, you got to learn how to cut you need to be able to change directions yep. in the most efficient way possible and he says you know he was doing it in a frame by frame you know we're taking video he's looking at it frame by frame being able to break down what should be happening from a biomechanical point of view right. when the athlete's changing directions right 
And this is something, as you know, that never gets talked about at the elite ever. level. Yeah. It, yeah. Ne it never, it's not even a subject. Like you could yeah. even, if you brought it up in, in a coach's meeting, they'd look at you like you're out of your mind. But like, you know, you know, it's funny, yo. So especially talking to Ryan, like coaches have chunked enough images in their brain to know what good versus not they may not articulate yeah. it like new yeah. coaches are smart man tactical coaches are really smart they may not articulate it like you or i but like they know what they're looking for i think with basketball mechanics we just we applied physics and biomechanics to what their gut intuitively was telling them you know like if you talk to any good any good basketball coach they'll know a hey, shifty change of direction uh, that they, they'll use like kind of buzzwords, like guards are going to be yeah. good at ball screen situations, or, Hey, it's not necessarily the strongest guy that's going to win on the post. It's going to be the guy with the best leverage and the best. Yeah. Like, so they, they understand what they're looking for, but maybe we gave them more of a roadmap to be more specific to what, like probably their gut was intuitively telling them. I think, I think what it is, 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 is it's, it's a, a more, uh, uni I don't want to say universal, but it's a way of standardizing the language uh, that that articulates what they're trying to say better, right? Because yeah. people are using different words that are kind of, they don't mean anything. Like they're not real. I, yeah. I say this all the time. People in, in our field and in, in sports, they use words that aren't real words. Yeah. Like, like they don't yeah. say anything. I know that they're trying to get something across, but it's not. Like it's not the right. Yeah. Yo, so what, what I'm hearing now more is, uh, especially in the NFL combine, is twitchy. He's real twitchy. Yeah. You yeah. The, to, <laughs> to me, I, that means you got Tourette's. It's, yeah. You know, that was, that's, that's my. Yeah. That's that's what I would be thinking when he's twitchy. <laughs> what are you talking about, twitchy? Yeah. What's that mean? But, but and, I know uh, what trying to say, like again, it's a buzzword. But uh, those coaches know, man. Those tactical coaches are really smart, and they're experts contextually within the game like they know yeah, what they're absolutely talking. yeah it's what they do for a living sure yeah for sure sure, for sure. it's just it's just a matter of standardization of language and and really fully articulating it's not i think one thing that have i, I tell this to other people who ask me i said i, I like it, sport coaches i said in in the in the science field you're not allowed sloppiness in language right you got to say what you mean and mean what you say precisely because somebody's waiting to tear you up if you sure slip yeah. in, in artic you know if you're poor at articulating it i said you guys and this is not a knock but you have a little bit of a luxury of not being held to that same standard of you better know what you're talking about like i can't like if i were amongst so you envision this i'm at a table i got dr bandar chuk dr vladimir asur and dr michael yes we're at a table right the, the, this really happened and we're talking so i'm the kid by a mile i'm 52 and i'm the kid the, the, the next the next oldest person's 30 years older than i am and i'm the dumbest by a mile <laughs> i don't start shooting my mouth off talking about anything unless i know exactly what i'm talking about and even then i'm quiet i just ask questions but but you know you're not going to get by with just running your mouth because they'll know you're full of crap right away, right? Oh yeah, especially <laughs> at that table. Yeah, at that table. I mean, you're not you like like yeah. this is uh, it's like being uh, uh, you know like at a superhero table of our field, right? Yeah. And, and so you're not going to get away with that. And I think what I like about what you're doing is is that you're raising that standard of communication and language amongst sport coaches as well, though, where you're saying this is what that is call it this or you, you know like this is what we're trying to articulate and i like that and i like the fact I, I tell you what i like the most is that you're going underneath the the the, the boilerplate stuff and getting down to what really is happening in a game or in a situation that uh, that predicts or 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 i guess contributes to success it's it's a real life thing because i as you were talking about athletes and length and, and i'm going through my head and stuff and saying you know a guy like patrick beverly defies convention yeah yeah so what is he six one and he'll guard anybody he doesn't care anybody yeah he he actually so without giving too much away he qualified for two top 10 defensive categories as least points per possession yeah. hip abduction yeah. velocity crazy his defensive stance was actually so when we modeled out all the best on ball defenders in the nba um all of the averages was typically where we saw Pat Bev in every time on ball. 
So he, he was the model, so to speak, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing because he doesn't fit any, like, if you look at him ahead of time, you're like, no, this guy doesn't have anything that you want, you know, in terms of defense, maybe from, from, if you just looked at his body. Right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, but he, but there's so much more to athleticism than vertical jump, than, you know, the three quarter court, Th- those are factors. And I think they matter and they're valuable, yeah. but there's a lot more. There's no a lot doubt. More. It's like, I, w- the way that I tell people uh, uh, when, w- uh, with with athleticism is everything are indi- they're like economic indicators. Like you could say, you know, unemployment, interest rates, productivity, all these different factors. Right? Not one of them is is the factor. It's the right. it's it's the aggregate. Right? It, it, and and like you could say, un- I, the, the example I always use is that you could say that unemployment is really low in the United States. That's great. Well, it was zero in the Soviet Union. How did that work out? Right. It's right, not right. the only thing. So you have to look at everything in terms of, of the whole picture of athleticism and really hone in on these things that are more specific to basketball. A vertical jump is great, but there's a lot more that goes into it because we know guys that can jump out of the gym that can't play. Absolutely. Uh, you've seen you've seen that at your at your level. You've seen that a ton where, you know, yeah. guys that are amazing athletes and they can't right. play. And, yeah. and then you'll have another another guy like Patrick Beverly who. Eh, it's okay, you know, yeah. but but they're paying him really well, and, and this kind of goes back to my. Uh, I think the the the, the, the value in, in, in this is that you center in on what matters, and what I've always said is the is the uh, CTC, the cut the check model, which is if it doesn't contribute to that guy getting a, a paycheck, a scholarship, or an Olympic medal, it doesn't matter. So, yeah. kind of cutting through the fluff and getting down to the parts that really matter as to why is this guy successful and how can you be more successful by integrating some of these principles in there is it's kind of, you know, I, I think it's the great value in, 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 in what you guys brought to the table on this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the, the Pat Bev's a great example. Um, and, and he does outperform his peers in the fact, uh, anthropometrically, uh, wingspan relations to the height. He was like plus, plus four or five inches, which is really wow. good. But yeah. He, so he had length relative to height, um, but he just understands angles like he just yeah. he, he understands where to be. He understands, you know, um, how to position his body and limbs like to avoid contact in certain situations and then when to make contact in others. So he just knows how to play, you know. Yeah. So that's yeah. 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 For Yosef. yeah. 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 Well, listen, I've taken up a lot of your time, but this has really been fascinating for me too. And we're going to, we got to do this again because I got more oh, questions, absolutely. but, yeah. uh, but, but yeah, let, let's, let's regroup on this and do this again because uh, there's more, there's more to talk about here. And I think that it's applicability is, uh, is broad across management, scouting, coaching and coaching at each level. And then also with trainers and players. So for people who are looking at the book, you, you guys can check it out on our site. You can also get it on Amazon, Basketball Mechanics. Like this literally will cover, you know, from the athlete all the way up to a general manager and a professional team and all points in between. It has value like, the, the you know, everybody involved will have value. You can take something from the book and apply it. And that's to me, like the biggest thing is actionable information because we just we kind of uh, uh, excoriated <laughs> that idea is, is that. It should be actionable. Yeah. And, and that's what I like about what you, you put in there. You put value in there that someone can take home and use right away. And, and, and that's awesome. Um, what, so before we go, tell me what's next. What's, what's the next iteration of this? Yeah. So, um, well, we, we want to just put it out there and receive feedback from great coaches and practitioners like yourself. Um, so if anybody does have feedback out there, um, feel free or, you know, constructive criticism on what we can do better. Um, and we've gotten really good feedback uh, up to this point. I think for the second edition, what we want to do is uh, have an epidemiological chapter, just looking at potential risk and mechanisms of certain injuries within the NBA. We also want to have training inter- interventions, right? Um, so let's say you have a college uh, freshman that does not have enough knee extension velocity room protecting the rim, even though they have enough length, what do we do to identify, like uh, address 
that mechanical deficiency, right? So I think it's two components, uh, potential risk from an injury standpoint, and then interventions as far as the training standpoint will be, will be in the second edition. Huge. That yeah. is huge and very valuable. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I'm looking forward to us talking again here pretty soon. And everybody, you know, you can check this out, uh, Basketball Mechanics on Amazon. Uh, you can also check it out on our site, uaconcepts.com. And you can go to our Facebook page and give us feedback. I'd lo- we'd love to hear from everybody and see what they think about it and, uh, and, and let us know. So, Adam, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And let's talk really soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Yosef. Thank you.